Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence into our hearts, into the study, into our midst. We ask, Lord, that um, as we open your word, as we continually look for light, that um, you can encourage our hearts, that you can give us strength, that we can draw close to you and understand more of your care for us. We pray, Lord, that we can reveal your character to those around us, that we can uh, show uh, your, your love in all that we do. We pray for each person who's a part of these studies and those that watch these studies online. Just ask that your Holy Spirit can be with them and that you can watch over us with your angels. And we pray for our families and our trials uh, that we presently face. We just pray, Lord, that you can strengthen us as we draw strength from your word. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. So as we... Um, we were finishing off yesterday with um, some stuff dealing with uh, a nuclear accident in Arkansas, which, uh, well, I don't know if that was part of the study or if it was afterwards, that uh, happened in the 1980s. Now, I looked into it. I didn't really see anything there that interested me, but uh, maybe there's something that somebody else has seen about that who's looked into it. So... Uh, yeah, because Kelly, that that video you linked me to, it seems to be me more of a propaganda piece than anything, but that's just my perspective. So I don't know. Anyway, yeah, we. we you know. Now, for me, it was more about. It wasn't just a single one. It was that, that there were so many. Yeah, I know. So many near nuclear yeah. accidents. Yeah, I, I wasn't really In, too impressed. I, I think they're overstating things, but somebody else has it more. Just showed me that, it just showed me that God's holding back. Yeah, yeah. I, I just thought it was more a propaganda piece about the dangers of nuclear stuff. But but anyway, that, that is my perspective. <clears throat> okay, book, so we start. It was based on, the book it was based on was an award-winning book, if that means anything. Not really, no. Would have been Zebby. <laughs> okay. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto his house, uh, unto the house of thy father, all the all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel. Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in mine habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. So we, we had looked at this verse, and we had looked at uh, the man of God. Right. So people remember what we found about the Hebrew numbers connected with man of God. So it doesn't say who this man of God is, but I looked at the Hebrew numbers. Man is 376, which is just simply uh, ish, right? And God is, of course, Elohim, 430. So people remember what I did with those numbers? I don't. I, I took the average, right? And the average was 403. And 403 is the number of months. Well, it's the number of Islamic years in the 391 years of Revelation 9 prophecy. And uh, in 403 months, you get 11,900 days and 1,190 minutes. And um, so it, it is a symbol relating to the prediction regarding July 18th in connection with Islam. So when we do something like this, so when we make an application, so we've we've, we've addressed that um, that Eli uh, 
that we could zoom up. We can make a larger application dealing with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, but we had zoomed in and we saw a parallel between Eli and um, and Jeff, right? So, which which was kind of a painful discussion yesterday, just dealing with that. But basically, it's just the neglect to have this proper discipline within the movement. So it was very literal sort of thing dealing with uh, the favoritism of his family and so forth. So I don't know. I don't really like talking about it, even thinking about it. But we can see the parallel with with Eli in that context. But we could also zoom out and see a larger context. But when we took this man of God here and we we took those Hebrew numbers, it it applied to what we already understood that there was uh, this message of July 18th that really was the message of rebuke to the movement. And can we see that the message of July 18th was a message of rebu rebuke? Oh, uh, so? Hmm? What you say? I didn't catch it, Kelly. Uh, how so? How was it a message of rebuke? Well, okay. And anyone else want to deal with how it's a message of rebuke? How was July 18th a message of rebuke to the movement? That we have been relying too much upon man and not enough upon God. Okay. Yeah. And and what we expected from July 18th uh, really was to uh, flatter our own egos, I guess, for one way of putting it. Right. So people wanted to be vindicated. They wanted to win the, the spiritual lottery as far as being able to witness to their family and friends. And that's uh, a great kind uh, of way. That kind of. Okay, Kelly, and then Dwight. I, I, I know that kind of happened with the prediction about Trump becoming president. He was like everyone, well, it was pretty much impossible. People were saying, no way could that guy become president. And, when he did, and we were saying that he would. Yeah. And 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 basically, the, the original prediction was back in 2015 that we made that prediction. Yeah. So the July 18th message, it says, and the chat was intended to humble us down and not show us that we, that we do not know anything as we ought to know. Right? So, yeah, it was meant to humble us. And... Now, of course, if God's people had fulfilled their role, if they had been humble, right, if we had real true unity, I mean, things might have happened differently in this world. But it revealed to us our spiritual condition. Now, Dwight, you had a comment as well. Well, my, my comment basically is that that was a very kind way of putting it. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. So... I mean, I know that some of the people after July 18th, their big disappointment was basically it made them look foolish. And so that means that that showed the motive that they had behind uh, believing it. Right. Right. Because they said, well, we look foolish. And now, you know, I told people the July 18th that Nashville was going to be hit by a fireball and and that didn't happen. And now. You know, I look like a fool and nobody will listen to anything I say anymore and so forth. So it was all really about them, right? Nobody was happy, you know, that Nashville didn't get destroyed or anything like that. They were just disappointed about their own their own uh, uh, reputation, I guess. Well, I'll speak for myself. Mm -hmm. I have friends that live in the Nashville area. I have the parents of a friend that live in the Nashville area. Mm -hmm. When it didn't happen, I was actually relieved because at this point, the idea of that kind and that level of destruction is not an easy thing to have to consider. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was a number. I mean, I was, I was very relieved. <laughs> Um, one is I, I sort of felt responsible because I was the one who came up with the date, but, um, you know, hope that it wouldn't happen. I mean, I also never wanted to mislead anybody. Right. So 
in the in the big picture, we have yeah. a lot of questions as to the why. But speaking as one that was involved, I made multiple phone calls to different parties at the behest of FFA. I took a lot of criticism from people that just did not like the fact that that Jeff was willing to publicly and to the world address a prediction that Mrs. White had made. And there are many that have been considered by themselves to be, quote, good Adventists that believe that Jeff should apologize to the church for the embarrassment that he caused the church. Yeah. Now, I know Adventists tend to have embarrassment about 1844 as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I noticed that when I became an Adventist. Uh, that just, and, and that's obviously, you know, one of the fears they have about any sort of predictions on any level, uh, especially generational Adventists. So they tend to be a little more sensitive when it comes to that kind of stuff. They, they don't like being called a cult or looking at as being foolish in any way. And and so there's kind of an embarrassment about the beginning of Adventism, which is one of the reasons I think that many Adventists don't really know much about Millerite history. It's like, you know, they were wrong. And so why are we worrying about that? You know, um, and so obviously the rejection of the 2300 days. Um, now, Kelly had sent me um, uh, there's Reindeer Brunzema. I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name. Uh I think he's Dutch, but I could be wrong. But I'm friends with him on Facebook, and he's an Adventist scholar. And uh, he's, you know, he, he's extremely liberal. I mean, I don't, he doesn't believe in Adventism, <laughs> which doesn't really make much sense. But his, his view is, that, you know, he just wants to reform Adventism to be, you know, more liberal, right? So that's why he continues to be an Adventist. I've had a number of discussions with him, and and he has a huge following on Facebook. And so when we look at this message, so we so we, we look at the message in regard to a rebuke on Jeff, but let's zoom back out and deal with the church. So the church has, it was confronted with this message, right? Uh, because it went international. Uh, this is really the first time the church on on the, you know, the big level, obviously local conferences would deal with, you know, people in this movement. But as far as the general conference, they had Jeff wasn't was nobody. Right. He wasn't anybody on their radar. They never talked about him. Definitely the Biblical Research Institute had no interest in any of this kind of stuff. And uh, the general conference knew nothing about about this movement. But because of that July 18, 2020 prediction, it and its international scope you know, we now, the move, the church knew about this movement. And, and they knew about it prior to July 18. And of course, the church just totally rejected it. They didn't look at it. Right? They've already basically had, had settled on the fact that um, there's no new light to come to Adventism. And definitely they've rejected Millerite history. So, you know, so the foundation of Adventism had been rejected a long time ago. I mean, they just don't have any clue about any of this stuff. Now, for me, as somebody who became an Adventist and knew about, right, from the beginning, uh, the problem, in quotation marks, with Adventism, and that this was an issue of biblical chronology and Bible prophecy. I mean, that's why I've spent so many years studying these things. But until, you know, the last 10 years, 12 years, you know, I, I still was still was searching and looking for the evidences of is Adventism true? Now, you know, I believe it is. Um, obviously, I believed many things about Adventism because I practiced being an Adventist, but I still had, you know, doubts in my mind about a lot of different things. And now those those are gone because of the things that I've studied. Because it's just absolutely impossible to not be true. 
but people won't look into it. So we had this message. So we can say this, this man of God is symbolic of a message that comes unto Eli. Eli uh, can represent the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He can also represent Jeff, right? Depends on how we're zoomed into this fractal, right? The fractal is the same. And, and we're still going to address that bigger line of the church. Now, when it says here, did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Uh, what is this a reference to? Isn't that a reference directly to the gospel? Well, God. no, I'm saying historically. I appeared unto the, so, unto the house. Yeah. Okay, Stephen. So that would be Aaron when. Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it would go all the way back to Aaron. Now, um, but it's it's interesting how it's phrased. Why is it phrased in this way? Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? What What's the. Isn't it the word to the Levites? What do you mean? Well, when it's saying, did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father? which we are saying is Aaron, but could also be Moses. No, no, it's Aaron. Okay, it's Aaron. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's that's who it's referring to. I mean, well, it says, and did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? So that would have to be Aaron. Right, the next verse. To offer on upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me. So that's not the case of Moses. Okay. All right. Okay, so, so it's referring to Aaron and to the priesthood, right? So we know Eli is a priest. He's also a judge, but but primarily he's a priest, uh, the high priest. And did I give unto the house of thy father this here. all of the offerings made by fire of the yeah. children of Israel? Yeah, all the offerings made, yeah. Okay, so so he's going to be doing these these offerings, Right. He's the priest. That's basically what's being said here. But why, why is it, it placed in this way? What is what? Is, so first off, we have choose. Right. So what does it mean? He was chosen. Selected. OK. OK. Yeah, Set that's, aside. OK. Yeah. But I'm, that's not really the question. We all know what choose means, but just prophetically within a line. Think about Aaron, Moses, the line that we have. What is that? What what role does Aaron play and Moses in that line of the Exodus? Aaron is the expositor before Pharaoh. He's the one that explains to, he speaks for Moses in front of Pharaoh. Okay, well, that's true. It's not really the question I'm asking. I'm asking about the structure of the lines. Okay. Right? Because we have a line. Do we have other lines where people are chosen? Isn't in every line there's somebody that's chosen? At least one person? There should be. Because you have to have a reformer. Now, we know that there's Moses as well in that line. Now, some lines we have two people at the beginning of the line. Some we don't. Why is that? Because remember, we have in in the line of of the deliverance from Babylonian captivity, we have uh, the Lord's anointed, which is Cyrus. But we also have Darius as well, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. So in Millerite history, we just have Miller, right? At, in 1798, we don't have any any other person that's there as a reformer. Correct. Okay. So, yeah, and Kelly just put in the chat a quote from Spirit of Prophecy regarding the destruction of Nashville that she saw in vision. Okay. So we have, we have a reform line that's, that's being talked about here. Right? That, that's my main point, I guess. I mean, there's I a thought, lot more. Yeah. William? Yeah. I thought Miller was a reformer. Yeah. Yeah. But there isn't two reformers when Miller is there. In the Exodus, there's there's Aaron and Moses, right? In our history in 1989, we have Jeff that's that's chosen, right, for the first angel's message. So I, I want people to think about this, what we're reading here. 
So we have this message and the message points us back to where, like maybe you already are just way ahead of me. And, you know, but So where does the message point back to? William? I was going to say it points back to the beginning. Right. So it's going to point back to the beginning. It's going to point back to the time of the end when the first message came. Does, does that make sense to people? I would think so. Yeah. So, so we need, we need to pay attention to these little details, right? Cause we could just easily read over this, but if we're going to take this as this message, this message has to go back to the foundations of Adventism, right? Which is what this message has done. And so he's going to go, go back. He's going to talk about when Aaron was chosen and the role and responsibility that he had. OK, so he he's not going to I mean, he's going to talk about his situation, but he's going to go back to the beginning. And, and that's what this movement has done. We, we can see that quite clearly. Now, back when I became a part of this movement in 2010, the first thing I ever saw was uh, 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 Manjit Bayat's video dealing with Revelation 9. So that was the first thing that I'd seen before I had gone to the camp meeting in Oklahoma because I was invited and I was directed by um, Merritt, uh, who's the guy who invited me, uh, to watch this video. So I watched this video of Manjit. And the thing that I was impressed about was the fact that he accepted the pioneer understanding of Revelation 9, which I had never seen anybody present <clears throat> before, right? I mean, I knew the pioneer understanding, studying the pioneers a bit, and, of course, spirit of prophecy. And I'd seen lots of people try to make new applications of Revelation 9, putting the trumpets in the future and the woes in the future, which, of course, we can't do. Right? History can be repeated, but you don't you, you have to still have the original application of those those prophecies. Right. So the one thing I knew about this movement is that it was based upon uh, the foundation of Adventism. It wasn't some new uh, interpretation of Adventism. Now, of course, the more I studied into it, the more I realized how how little I knew of our history and and how significant it was. But so that's the message, the message that has come to Adventism and to this movement is a message regarding the repeat of Millerite history and that we are, that we need to understand Millerite history. So that, so we can see that that message is, is for the church. So that's zooming out. You can look at that. Now, when it comes to, to Jeff, to our movement, if we're going to say that this message is applying to him to July 18, 2020, we know that when when the rebellion happened with Parminder's group in on August 29th, 2019, and then Jeff is going to respond to that on September 7th, 2019. Now, Jeff, at that time, he's he is aware that he had made a grave error in appointing Parminder as the leader of the movement, right? Wanting to retire and giving that to Parminder. Right. Parminder had deceived him, so he was deceived. Now, um, and then we see, saw that the message of July 18th was then given to the movement and should have been taken as a rebuke even prior to the disappointment. That is, Jeff did, in a sense, accept the rebuke on some level because he had originally accepted the July 18th date. But when Parminder and Tess, you know, dismissed it, he ended up uh, setting it aside. Now, part of that had to do with um, the attacks upon me personally, right? So back in 2018. Now, I ended up having to apologize to Jeff, but Jeff never apologized to me, which, you know, probably he should have. He should have said, yeah. You know, I was wrong. I listened to this, this rumors, but he still continued to listen to Bronwyn, which was not wise. 
right? And that just created all kinds of problems. So, so in a sense, he never really overcame that. Now, when we were looking at it in regard to the church, where did we say that the glory has departed? You know, Ichabod. Where did we place that? In, in as we zoom out in the, our lives, what way uh, Mark did we'll yeah. go out on a limb and say 9 11? Yeah, 9 11. Yeah, so that's where we had the glory departing. Now we can see is there a connection between 9 11 and July 18, 2020? Yes, okay. What is the connection? Our initial understanding of that, how we were looking at it, is it 9 11? was showing how the leadership of the church had been bypassed and July 18th was showing how the leadership in the movement had been bypassed. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking more basic just to the idea that 9-11 is the arrival of the third woe, which is Islam. Right. Now, remember, 9-11 serves two roles. It's, it's the empowerment of the first angel's message in Millerite history, which is August 11th, 1840. It parallels that way, Mark. And it also par parallels the arrival of the second angel in Millerite history on April 19th, 1844, right? So you've got that, uh, those two dates that 9-11 represents, right? So we have 9-11 is, is basically two different way marks, even though it's one event, which, which caused confusion at first when that was introduced. And and the way that we understand it is that the problem that we had in doing that is that we didn't realize we were zoomed into 9-11 in making that application. We came later to realize that November 9th, 2019, actually is the arrival of the second angel in 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 a line that that that's sort of a uh, a bigger line, right? So as we zoom out a little bit about the movement. But the point is, July 18th is part of that. So July 18th was supposed to be Islam attacking the United States. And so you would see that we had a restraint of Islam at 9-11, and then this was supposed to be a loosening of Islam on July 18th, 2020, right? Didn't happen, but that's how we understood it, Okay. Hopefully that, that makes sense. So when we zoom into the movement, we say, uh, the, where does the glory depart in the movement? July 18th? No. That's a good guess. But wouldn't it be November 9th, 2019, with the separation that occurred in the movement? Because 9-11 is the glory departing. That's going to be the first day of the first month as a symbol. And we have all kinds of structures that show that. And, and November 9th, 2019 is also going to serve that, that function. So the way that we had it in 2016 is we had Millerite history as April 19th, the first day of the first month, it's 9-11. And then we had midnight, July 21st, 1844, midnight cry, August 15th, 1844. And then uh, the Sunday law, October 22nd, 1844, closed door. And then we took our line, the 777 days, with November 9th being the first day of the first month, July 18th being the formalization of that message. So, so you're going to see November 9th is going to line up with 9-11. And then you have the midnight cry would be March 27th. 2021, and then you would have uh, the Sunday law being December 25th, 2021, right? That's that's how we had that line structured. It, a symbolic line, not, not literal, which is what we came to understand is that this line was symbolic, that it was um, showing a parallel between Millerite history and our history. Now, we also lined up July 18th with October 22nd, 1844 as a disappointment, but that's that's actually uh, a different magnification of that line. That is, it's going to be too hard to explain right now, but basically July 18, 1844, Samuel Snow's last letter really parallels July 18 in that line, right? 
That is, it's, it becomes more a formalization of the message connected to prior to midnight. But anyway, that's some of that's beside the point. The, the main thing to see here is that our movement had this opportunity. They were rebuked by this message. And uh, the result was verse 29, or at least what uh, the rebuke continues on. Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in mine habit, my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of the offerings of Israel, my people. So, so this is the rebuke made to Eli. Now, what is this rebuke describing? As you said, painfully, it comes to me, it's, I don't know, just taking a stab at it, that when July 18 happened, School of Prophets shut down. Where did all that money go? I don't I don't know. Put all the money from oh, selling yeah. school? It would just go to FFA and they could just disperse it among, you know, as salaries among uh, the people there. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, even if it's a non-profit it's fire, well. yeah, they could live off the money. I don't know. I mean, obviously, they didn't give it to another non-profit society. They just kept it within that organization. Yeah. There wasn't any transparency. It was the same thing with Future Future News Canada. When I asked Tabo about all the money when he when he d separated from Future for America, and yeah, there, there were a lot of chief chiefest <laughs> the fat. There was a lot of fat. Right. Yeah. So that's what you're that's you're good. talking about. So the offerings. Yeah. That people had given for the, these ministries are just, they make themselves fat with it, right? So it's kind of a hard thing yeah. to talk. But but that's always a problem. Yeah, I you know, especially when you're dealing with lots of money. Money changes people's uh, perception of things. It changes them. So, you know, I mean, nobody really knows what happened with the money, I guess. You know, how, how it would uh, be used. But yeah, they sold, um, you know, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars when they sold the school. And they also had lots of money still prior to that. So I don't know, you know, to some people, it's not a lot of money. But uh, I know, I know prior to July 18, people, I know, I know one, one, two friends, a couple, I mean, they were prepared to sell their home and and be without even a home to live just to give money toward warning Nashville. Yeah. I forget what prevented them from doing that, but I know, I know others that gave thousands. I, I, I gave up to a thousand or something like that myself, but yeah, it's, it's not about what we gave or didn't give. It's, it's where's the transparency in it. That, that's always bothered me. Yeah. But anyway, this is kind of what ended up happening, that that the work that was supposed to be done is is becomes distorted. Right. It, it becomes perverted. It's really to make themselves fat. Right. And, you know, no, but none of us would want to be in that situation and that type of responsibility of people's funds. But but that's what happened. And so. You know, people have to make, I guess, the decisions that they see best. But it, it definitely, you know, the people who are in control end up controlling the funds and the money. And that's one thing I liked about uh, when uh, Future News Canada went from uh, Roland. You know, he didn't try to retain control of it when he left. Now, he was pretty upset with Tabo when Tabo left uh, Future for America and he wanted to try to uh, deal with things, but that's a whole other story. But, you know, you would think somebody who's a part of a ministry and they don't want to have any part in it anymore, that they wouldn't, you know, hopefully take over all the funds and just use them as they see fit. That, 
the people who want to still be a part of that ministry should have some control. But that's not how it happens, right? So it's people in control of these things. So anyway, that's any other thoughts about this? And this word kick really means more like trample, uh, trample down uh, at my sacrifice, my slaughter and mine offering. Any thoughts? If they were trampling down the sacrifice, are they also not disregarding Christ's sacrifice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so obviously we look at this in uh, this, obviously, the spiritual sense. Now, we know that this is going to be like the peace offerings and so forth that they're, that they're, um, you know, mostly defiling. But, um, but we can see that this is the handling of the gospel. Correct. Okay, so now, um, now we have this. Um, okay, so I'm just looking at some of these things here. So you kick you at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I've commanded in my habitation or abode. That's like the tabernacle or the temple. Um, and honors thy sons above me to make yourselves fat. The chiefest of all the offerings of the Israel, my people. Okay, so. What's that word chiefest? Well, chiefest is is basically the word uh, resh. It's reshit. It's it's the first word in the Bible. Bereshit. Bereshit. Yeah. Yeah. The first word. Yeah. I thought it was in. I thought it was in. Well, in Hebrew, the word is one word. It's bereshit. The bet means in, and the reshit means beginning. But it's one word in Hebrew. Is it has a, a a prefix? The prefix is the bet prefix, right? The letter B. So, but anyway, the word is the sheet, right? Now, uh, the word is related to. It's, so creation it's was, creation was the chiefest of God's, like the crowning act of God's creation was man, was it? Yeah, but just, yeah, so don't take Hebrew that way. So Hebrew has this one word, uh, rosh, which means head. Uh, that's the Hebrew number 7218. Okay. And that, that word has all kinds of different applications. It can mean first. It can mean head. It can mean chief. It can mean beginning, depending on its form and, and the context in which it's in. Right. So here it could just mean uh, uh, like the first of all offerings, right? But the idea here is like the best ones, right? In that sense, in you know, the better ones, right? That's what his sons were doing. So does that make sense? So don't, yeah, it, it could also mean chief, yeah. you know, right? Um, yeah, well, it makes had, sense. It's just, yeah. It's like, English, they, 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 and they, or there, 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 and there. It's, yeah. Yeah, but in the, in this Careful. case, it's 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 the same word. It's just it has different meanings depending on context. Like there's not really just one way to translate it into English. You know, because yeah. you could always say the head of all offerings if they just translated it literally, or the first of all offerings, or the chiefest of all offerings. Right. So. It's just how Hebrew is. It, it has limited vocabulary, unlike English. You've got lots of words for the same thing. They have one word for lots of things. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Angela has something there about hirelings. I'm not. Why do you bring up hirelings, Angela? Because those are people that gratify themselves and their their lust for money and okay. titles instead of feeding the flock, taking care of the flock. Yeah. Like I okay. think all all the investors should have been repaid, but that's my opinion. <laughs> okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, but here here in this verse, it doesn't really talk anything about hirelings or these. This is those are that are chosen by God. Uh, to lead out that are going to fail. 
Yeah, I'm going look. back back a few. Yeah. And just to uh, Numbers 18, 8, it says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Behold, I have also given thee the charge of mine heave offerings of all the hallowed things of the children of Israel, even or unto thee have I given them by reason of the anointing and to thy sons by an ordinance forever. Right. So we can see that here the heave offerings, which are connected to peace offerings, right? Those are the types of things that they're they're abusing, right? That is these offerings that are given where they have a, a certain portion allotted to them, they're taking the best of the offerings and giving the people the worst part and less than they're supposed to. So they're taking more than they should. And so we can see the parallel there. Angela, Angela makes an interesting point there that the money for the Nashville campaign or ad or whatever was returned. So just stop at Future for America. It would have been interesting for them to try to return it to the people who gave it in the first place. But Tabo tried to explain it to me about charitable organizations, how it's managed, but to me it just sounded like a word salad of confusion. Yeah, tap, tap, tap was like justification, justification. Yeah, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was just thinking about, okay, you you have sold your property. What about all the folks who sacrificed to give to this, you know, company, firm, whatever you want to call it, and we're just left in the lurch. Same thing with FNC. I mean, I'm poor. Like, I'm living on my pension, right? I gave thousands to Tabo, put it right into his hand. And I didn't think later, well, maybe I should, didn't, didn't, you know, ask for that. But to get it back, I thought, the heck with it. These people are going down. Whatever they keep, whatever they, they, they covet, whatever they try to do to harm us, God is going to hold them to account. Let God take care of it. I've never been one to covet money. I can honestly say that. The only time I had anxiety about money was when I was raising my family. Yeah, and it, it's it's always a difficult thing. I mean, obviously, you you give in, I mean, in good faith that people are going to use it for the Lord's work. And, and probably the money was used, some of it. You know, I don't think you can ask for it back. But in the case of, like, the Nashville where people who donated specifically for a reason, they could actually ask the person, you know, do you want it back, right? You know, the person could have said, no, you, you keep it, you know. But, you know, that doesn't generally happen because, you know, they paid for the ad and then they got the money given back. So they ended up with it. But I think most people probably wouldn't have wanted the money back at that point. They'd just probably tell Jeff to keep it, right? It's only going to be later on that we're going to have these other problems. I did do want to add that, you know, I wasn't advocating for myself when I was speaking to Tabo about returning money. It was other people that gave so much. They impoverished, impoverished themselves to, to support yeah. it. And yeah, and Tabo wasn't, wasn't, Tabo wasn't being honest with you. I mean, no, I'm I, thinking of Sorry, sorry, Theodore. I'm thinking of Paul, and he said, I labored night and day, travailing, that I would not, you know, I would, I, so that I would not be relying on you to supply my needs. Well, I'm, I'm the same way. Like, I have been homeless many times. I have never, never asked my kids for a dime. In fact, when they were in debt, sometimes I would pay their bills for them. You know, it's just this attitude of, of, covetousness of, of avarice. I just loathe it. it. I just can't conceive of people taking advantage of, of, of others like that. You know, and I have well, wealthy children. Like some of them are quite well, wealthy. And one of them one of them told me, he said, you wouldn't believe the amount of money I make. But he said, what I like about you, mom, is you never ask for money. Yeah. Well, and the one thing, you know, when somebody does give you money for the Lord's work, it's a huge responsibility. You, you you hardly can think that you can buy stuff for yourself <laughs> because it's like, well, you know, now they gave me this money, you know, I can't just buy whatever I want, even though none of our money is really ours. But you understand what I mean? Like it, it definitely limits what you're going to do with that money. You want to use it in the Lord's work. So, 
you know, you want to live frugally to sort of honor what other people do in giving you money. Right. I mean, that's the way I feel. But anyway, um, it says, wherefore, in verse 30, wherefore, the Lord God of Israel saith, I have indeed, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now, how do we address this in, is God going back on his word? No. How can you keep a contract if if the party you've contracted with breaches it? Yeah, no, God, of course, has has done that in that he's made a contract, the covenant, the new covenant, where it's based upon his promises. And and we obviously have aren't, aren't part of that. We have failed God time and time again, but yet his love will still continue. But there is conditions here when it says, you know, that the house and the house of thy father should walk me for, before me forever. I mean, that still was conditional because they have to walk before him, right? So when he says, uh, for them that honor me will I honor and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. It's not really God changing his mind. He's always been this way, right? Those that are going to honor God, he will he will honor, right? That it's it's not it's not him changing his mind. He's not being fickle. Now his purposes are still going to be worked out, as as we see that's unfolded through history of of God's purposes. But he he says similar things about Israel, and we know that God closes his probation upon Israel. You know, with the stoning of Stephen in thirty four A.D. So, you know, God didn't change his mind. It's just that his plan expands so that in the end, all Israel shall be saved. Not talking about literal Israel, but talking about um, spiritual Israel. Okay. Okay. I'm going to read some things here from the spirit of prophecy. Henry Kellogg has not selfishly studied ease or convenience. He has been true to the interests of the office, but many things that need his attention remain unnoticed because he has so many extra burdens to carry. His interest is interwoven with the office of publication. His name has not been registered in the church book, but it should stand there where he has proved himself. His influence must tell in the church, and he needs all the advantages he can gain in the service of God. Them that honor me, I will honor, saith the Lord. So it's just, anybody know who Henry Kellogg is? Was he a brother uh, of John Harvey? Yeah, I don't, I, I think he might have been uh, John Harvey Kellogg's brother. I think he's the one who started the Corn Flakes uh, company, but I'm not certain. Right? Because I, I, I think his name was Henry Kellogg, but I could be wrong. Um, wealth or position will not avail when we come to the Father. The name of Jesus is our password. And as we plead in the name of our mighty advocate, for his sake, our sins are washed away. In this world, there is neither comfort nor happiness without Jesus. We must acknowledge him as our friend and our savior. How can we fail to love him when he has first loved us? In him, our matchless charms Oh, that we may all be with him through the ceaseless ages of eternity. So here we have uh, steaming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Moses kept his eye fixed upon the recompense of the reward. Hebrews eleven twenty six. Let us likewise keep our eyes fixed upon the reward which God has promised and walk in great humility before him. For he who says, then that honor me, I will honor um, will crown his faithful children with eternal glory and honor. Don't know how much of this. So it's just dealing with that verse, uh, mostly these statements, I guess. But just there's so many statements. I'm not going to read them all. Just quickly reading through some of these few things. Okay. You know, this part here, which you bolded there, Dwight, we keep the Savior too far apart from our lives. We want to consult him in all things. You know, I don't know 
about what other people do and how they make decisions. Because I'm not there. I don't see how see how much time they spend in prayer. But my impression is that I've seen people make many rash decisions. That is, I know they had no time to consult God in prayer prior to their decision. They reacted in ways that definitely did not glorify God. I've I've done that too. So I'm not like signaling any any other person out specifically. We we've all done this. And and especially in these these types of situations that that we had within the movement, I didn't see much of a spirit of prayer. That's probably not the guy there, Kelly, anyway. Um right, how how often did the movement uh, spend just like a season of prayer, especially in times of crisis. I mean, I know I was brought, you know, Heidi and I were brought before, uh, you know, these tribunals when we were there at the School of the Prophets. And there def- definitely wasn't a season of prayer. There was no seeking God, seeking unity. We, you know, a prayer would be said, but it was it was kind of those prayers that are directed at at you. And you know, like I don't, I don't recall any times where there was a call to fasting and prayer, so on. You said you do recall, or you don't? I do not, I do not recall any times like that at all. No. Yeah, and even even when I was at the school, you know, prayer just seemed to be a rushed kind of thing. You know, uh, I, I mean, I prayed with many individuals on my own, um, especially when there were situations that were tense and I would sometimes, you know, say, but, well, let's pray about this. But I didn't see that really happening too much uh, whenever there was conflicts. People just seemed to react. And, and, I, and I think if people had spent more time praying and seeking God, consulting him about what to do rather than their own feelings or other people, uh, the, the, the movement would have been in a much different situation. But of course, I don't know what goes on in people's lives individually. <clears throat> but it is something that we always have to consider uh, how important prayer is, especially when you're making a decision that affects some other person. You, you definitely need to pray with them. You need to seek God together. It is impossible for teacher or student to be connected with the God of wisdom without his intellect becoming developed and strengthened through the grace of Christ. He may then become a man of power to lead other souls to divine truth. The greatest work of the teacher is to lead those under his charge to be intellectual Christians. Then the mental and moral powers will develop harmoniously and they will be fit for any position of trust. Divine grace will give clearness and force to the understanding. To faith will be added a virtuous character, and they will be a bright light in the world. They present the power of Christianity in the well-ordered life and godly conversation. They will despise cheap, foolish jesting and joking. They will adorn the doctrine of Christ. Uh, the principles of truth are inwrought in their lives, and bright beams of light will shine forth from them to the world in good works. Their righteousness goes before them, as in the case of Daniel. And the glory of the Lord is their reward. Uh, the Lord has said, they that honor me, will I honor. God's word will be fulfilled, not a jot or tittle of it will fail. Many who will stand before the throne of God wearing the white linen, which is the righteousness of the saints, will be the sheaves that faithful example and earnest effort have brought to the master. Okay, yeah. Okay, um, nearly 3,000 years ago, by divine appointment, the temple was built in Jerusalem. The nation of God's choice had been greatly favored, and they now dwelt in costly houses while they still worshipped God in the curtain temple. Here the Shekinah, the visible emblem of God's presence, dwelt between the cherubim, and out of the perfection of beauty, God shined. The ark of God that had been constructed in the wilderness and had been born all the way from Horeb to Jerusalem during the pilgrimage of 40 years, still remained in the tabernacle. So if your business presses strongly and urges you to work, then there is a need of pressing strongly and firmly firmly to the throne of God, securing his protecting care, his aid, his mercy. 
and his blessing. Now, the reason you have no more comfort and peace and joy is because you have so little communion with God. You know, and that was the thing that I saw at the school, you know, back in 2018 and early 2019 when we were there, is that there seemed to be a lot of fretting, a lot of unhappiness about things. Now, I was always happy, which I think annoyed them, but uh, I was at peace with everything, you know. And it is just as convenient and essential for you to pray three times a day as it was for Daniel. Set the example at home before your workmen that prayer is the life of the soul, the very foundation of spiritual growth. Go to the little church of believers. Tell them we must keep the communication open between God and our souls. Tell them if they will find heart and voice to pray, God will find answers to their prayer. Neglect not your religious duties. Tell the church. We must pray. We must seek if we would find. We must knock if the door is opened. If there are no more than six assembled, there are enough to claim the promise. But there are more than six present. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Angels are there to admire your faith, your steadfast principles, and there you may have the pouring out of his Holy Spirit. God has rich blessings in store for you, and when you will not only bring all the tithes, but all the time and strength and brain and bone and muscle, to give to his services. Then you will walk in the light. Then you will triumph in God. The law and the gospel are one, both cemented in one, and the great blessings and favors given us of God call for a response from every creature God has made. But those who do not walk in accordance with the light and privileges bestowed, after a time, the long forbearance of God ceases towards them. Um, and then it will be found by them to be a terrible thing to have exhausted the divine patience and provoked the wrath of God and his mercies are turned and provoked the wrath of God and his mercies are turned into a curse. Okay, there's lots of things here. Okay. Talking here about Daniel. I know there's lots of good quotes here. I just don't want to read all of this. There's lots of pages. I know you put this all together, Dwight, but uh so it take a long time to read. Um, there, there was one point. Yeah. As you're as we're scrolling through this. Yeah. And you'd, you'd have to go back up because this is on page 28 because it answered a question that, that I'd had before that never really sunk into my thick head. Page 28. Well, I'm on page 16. I'm looking at. Uh, it's one of the not non-published articles. Okay. In script 35. Okay. 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 It says I'm on page 29 now. 28. Okay. You're almost there. That's page 27. Okay. Just no. Go back up. Go back up. Keep going. Keep going. One more. One little bit more. There you go. Okay. About Ezekiel. Correct. Okay. Now, all of all of this has to do with the, the one verse that they that honor me, I will honor, which is a snippet of that, that verse. Yeah. So. We covered Ezekiel fairly completely. Yeah. Now, Ezekiel 14 is part of his second vision, correct? Yeah. But. He's Ezekiel. going to have a third vision in Ezekiel 20. Okay. So, so from 8, 8 to 19 is his second vision. And Ezekiel 8 is the vision that shows what is going on within the temple. And as we would, as we would say, within the church. Yeah. So in this portion... From Ezekiel 14, 12 to 14, the word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then I will stretch out mine hand upon it and will break the staff of the bread thereof and will send famine upon it and cut off man and beast from it. Yeah, and this is, uh, you know, obviously a reference to Leviticus 26. All the way through. Yeah. Now, though these three men... Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it. 
they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Now, paragraph five, yet behold, there shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, which I've always believed is is a definition of, of us, or it's a, a symbol for us. But then in this, she skips from Ezekiel 14 to Ezekiel 28, verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. When you read this initially, there are some that are looking at this not as being Ezekiel being described, but that would think that this is describing the adversary. Okay. But here, she's telling us very directly that Ezekiel is the one that is wiser than Daniel. The Lord God had favored Ezekiel, the old and experienced service, servant of the Most High God. He was older than Daniel. Daniel was growing in favor with kings and with nobles. He was about to fill the important place of Ezekiel, and yet Ezekiel was not at all envious, but was glad that God was bringing in younger men, Daniel and his fellows, to stand firmly for the honor of God. So this is kind of the antithesis of what was going on with Eli at the time when the other the man of God gives this pronouncement to Eli and makes it clear that those that honor God, God will honor. Now, I mean, I, I still think that the, the now Ellen White making this uh, applying it to Ezekiel is just her taking this statement and applying it to Ezekiel because it is not talking about Ezekiel. Ezekiel is talking about the Prince of Tyrus. I understand, but I found this twice in in her writings, both making application to it. Yeah, yeah, but she is making an application. Just she's using this verse to apply to Ezekiel, even though in the context it's the Prince of Tyrus. There's nothing wrong with her using the verse that way. No, I, I'm not saying that there is. No. Now the, and, and it doesn't mean that the verse only means what she how she's applying it here. Well, <laughs> the the other point that I was I was intrigued with, the first sentence in paragraph number seven. The whole book of Daniel is a wonderful prophetic history. Mm -hmm. Now, she does not say that the whole book of Daniel is a wonderful literal history. She's saying that it is a wonderful prophetic history. Yeah. So we understand, obviously, it's a literal history, but it is prophetic. Right. In the sense of, of that history is typical which we've always understood. So, paragraph 8, God says, Them that honor me by exalting the principles of the Lord's government by their own steadfast principles, I will honor. The constant fidelity of Ezekiel and the four youthful captives gave strong representations of the character of God. The Old Testament gospel is very precious because of the convincing power of its inspiration. The word of the living God is of infinite value if it finds entrance into the heart, the heart receiving it as the word of God. And this means that its truths are applicable to the soul. Living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, they have a divine instructor that are practical doers of the lessons received. Yeah, so, I mean, one thing we see with... Um... Eli's sons is that they don't understand the significance of what they're doing, right? The the sacredness of the work. They don't care about that. Yeah. And there, there's a difference. But but I would say that that that's fairly common. That people, you know, are religious for lots of different reasons. Um and 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 we can tell that by how we live, right? That's where, you know, we we take the name of the Lord in vain, right? We're supposed to be 
connected with God, we're his children, and yet we don't represent him. And that and that's been true of the church, it's been true of the movement, it's been true of us in our lives, right? So we need to wake up to this reality. Well, when she continued in the passage from Sanctified Life that she ties back here to 1 Samuel 2.30. Okay, where's yeah. that? Uh, it's coming up in just a moment. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. What if Daniel and his companions had made a compromise with those heathen officers and had yielded to the pressure of the occasion by eating and drinking as was customary with the Babylonians? That single instance of departure from principle would have weakened their sense of right and their their abhorrence of wrong. Indulgence of appetite would have involved the sacrifice of physical vigor, clearness of intellect, and spiritual power. One wrong step would probably have led to others. Until their connection with heaven being severed, they would have been swept away by temptation. Now, this is a a great exposition of exactly the issue that was being presented regarding Eli and shown in his sons. Mm-hmm. So here they were, as Eli was very direct. They were indulging appetite and taking things that were not theirs. They were indulging more than just the appetite of what they were eating and drinking. They were indulging the physical appetite as well. Mm -hmm. So when they're doing this, they're turning their back on God. Yes, they are trampling on the sacrifice. They are disrespecting the very character of God and of Christ, and they're showing their total disregard for the commands of their father, of their earthly father. Mm -hmm. Now, had they not done this, what could have their example have been to all of Israel? Mm -hmm. But it was a situation that because they had abhorred the sacrifice, and by that, they turned their back on anything having to do with the gospel. Yeah, well, so, you know, when we look at the situation with this movement, it seemed pretty obvious to me that there was lots of people in the movement from my perspective, right? So I'm just looking at it from my perspective, who weren't really very spiritual, right? That is, they didn't seem to have a character that matched you know, what, what their character should be to be in sort of leadership positions. You know, I listened to the things they said about other people, um, the way that they communicated to, to other people, the way they communicated to me. But, you know, it was not my job to judge them or to condemn them. Right. It's just my job to try to live as a Christian myself. Right. But there just seemed to be and 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 the big problem was, of course, the belief that they were better than others, which is the real big problem. Right. Comparing themselves with others, the church, the church is the problem or other people are the problem or that group is different. I remember specifically after. um Parminder's group left the sort of boasting that went on, which which I always call it like a schoolyard talk. That is where, you know, you have a fight or whatever and, you know, you just tear down the other person and you build yourself up. And in reality, you're no different than the other person. You know better. And those things really troubled me at the time. Because I thought, you know, like, like. Sure, we're not we're not with Parminder's group, but we're not any better than them. So, <laughs> you know, this this is just a huge problem that that this movement has had to deal with, and that that we have not dealt with. So, I mean, 
God will honor those that honor him. And, you know, all of us have not represented God correctly. None of us really deserve to be honored by God. Amen. Yeah, so just different situ- situations that she's describing here, sort of parallels. The echo office, that's the Bible echo. Um, my brother, the money you expend in the tax imposed in connection with your secret organizations would supply many a want in the various branches of the cause of God. So this is the selfishness that exists within the human heart. I mean, we've all seen it. We've seen it in ourselves. We've seen it in others. You know, is there really a remedy, right? Can this ever be solved in God's work? Is it always going to be this way? You know, obviously it can't if God's work is going to be accomplished. There is a remedy. The remedy I found in my life is, is being humbled by God and life. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, one of the advantages, if if I want to call it an advantage I've always had, is that, uh, you know, being raised uh, the way I was, where things weren't valued, people were more valuable than things. Sometimes maybe I don't value things enough, but it's in some people's opinion. But, you know, we can live with so little. Like, we really need very little. In a way, in a, in a way July 18 was definitely a humbling of the movement. Mm-hmm. But what, how it was received depends on the person and so on. But I don't think it was received the way God intended by many. No, but it should have been. It just wasn't. Okay, well. We'll probably leave it there. I don't see, you know, maybe Dwight will have some things that he can bring out. But so there's this seventeenth uh, day, eighth month, biblical and rabbinic date. As your it has your digits of eighteenth uh, of July. Yeah, yeah, I know one eight seven. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll look at this. We'll come to this tomorrow. We'll look at these passages here. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Not right now. Okay. Right. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your rebuke of us. We know, Lord, that uh, we need your presence every moment. Sometimes the work that you've given us to do is overwhelming. We know that we're incapable of accomplishing what you ask apart from your help. And we pray for each person. Help us in the little things that you give us to do each day. Pray for your care and protection. And uh, I pray, Lord, that we can draw close to you throughout this day. Bring us together again to study is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.